For question one, I'll start with the left-hand side, which is equal to 3 and 5 over 7, divided by 1 and 5 over 8. I'll convert both fractions into improper ones. So 26 over 7, divided by 13 over 8. And then I'll keep the first fraction the same. I'll change division to multiplication and flip the second fraction. Now I can simplify the 13 with the 26. So I'll be left with 16 over 7, which is equal to and 2 over 7, which is equal to the right-hand side. For question 2, I have 90 kilometers per 1 hour. Now, this is equivalent to 90 times 1,000 meters over 1 times 60 to make it into minutes, times another 60 to make it into seconds, and if you put this on the calculator, you will get 25 meters per second. In question 3, set A has all the even numbers, which means I have 12, 14, 16, 18, and 20. The set A intersection B, which is this one, has the numbers 12, 16, and 20. Let's write those down. And now I can remove those from A. So the left part of A will only contain 14 and 18. Now this set here, A union B dash, are all the elements outside the union of A and B. The union of A and B is this thing here. So outside the two circles, I've got 17 and 19. And since the universal set are all the numbers between 11 and 20, the numbers missing are 11, 13, and 15. And this concludes the Venn diagram. For question four, I will equate A and D with BC. So I have 5x minus 1 equals to 3x plus 7.4. Let's take the 3x to the left and the minus 1 to the right. So 2x is equal to 8.4x comes out to be 4.2. Hence, the width of the rectangle is 5x minus 1. If you substitute the 4.2, this will come out to be 20. The length is given in the shape, it's 24. So the perimeter is equal to times 20 plus 24, which comes out to be 88. So 88 centimeters is the final answer. For question 5a, the lower bound of this number is 2.745, while the upper bound is 2.755. In part C, I'm given that Penny has worked out this calculation on the calculator. She got this answer, which is approximately 13,000, and we need to show that this is not sensible. Now, 81.3 is approximately 80. 59.2 is approximately 60. And then for the denominator, I've got 1.9 squared. That's about 2 to the power of 2. Now, the denominator is equal to 4. And I can cross this out with the 80. I'll get 20. And if I do this calculation, I'll get 1,200. Now, if you compare these two, you're going to see that her answer is about 10 times 1,200. So obviously something is not right. For question six, I'll use the midpoint formula, which is the following. So I have 6 plus 17 over 2, 4 plus j over 2. 
must be equal to k comma 15. Now, if I equate the x coordinates, I will get 6 plus 17 over 2 is equal to k. k comes out to be 23 over 2. And then I'll do something similar for the y coordinates. So I have 4 plus j over 2 is equal to 15. 4 plus j is equal to 30. So j is equal to 26. So 26 and 23 over 2 are the two answers. For question 7, I'll try and make the y's the same. I'll do so by multiplying the second equation by 4. I'll multiply the first one by 1, so practically I'm leaving this the same. So 5x plus 4y equals minus 2, and 8x minus 4y equals to 17.6. And now to get rid of the y's, I will add the two equations, so the 4y's cancel out. And then I get 13x equals to 15.6. So x comes out to be 1.2. And then I will substitute into an equation. I'll choose the second one, this one. So 2x minus y is equal to 4.4. So y is equal to 2x minus 4.4. Substitute the value of x we found, which is 1.2 and put this on the calculator, y will come out to be minus 2. So 1.2 and minus 2 is the pair of solutions. For question 8, I will use the following formula. The final amount equals to the initial one times the multiplying factor. I've got two banks, so I'm going to split my page into two. Now for bank G, the multiplying factor is equal to 100 plus 1.6, that's 101.6 over 100. And I'm going to square this because for two years, as a decimal, this is 1.016 to the power of 2. Now for bank H, the multiplying factor is equal 100 plus 2.9, that's 100 and 2.9 over 100 as a decimal at 1.029. So using the formula above, the final amount for the first bank is equal to 5,000 times my multiplying factor. Put this on the calculator, you'll get 5,161.28 and then repeat for bank H. So final amount equals to 5,000 times the multiplying factor. This will give you 5,145. So all I have to do now is just subtract the two numbers. So 5161.28 minus 5145. Put this on the calculator and you will get 16.28. For part of question 9, note that the power is 0. Anything to the power of 0 is equal to 1. For part B, I'll just split this into 3 to the power of 3, a squared to the power of 3, and b to the 4 to the power of 3. 3 to the power of 3 is 27, and then for the other 12, just multiply the powers, so I get a to the power of 6, b to the power of 12. Part C, the common factor is 7x squared y squared, and then you're left with 2y squared plus 3x. For part D, the equation of the straight line is given by y equals mx plus c. Now, to find the gradient, I'll use the following formula. The points I will use are 2, 0, and 0, 4, although you can use any other two points. So let's write them down, 0, 4, and 2, 0. So if you apply this formula, 
you get 4 minus 0 over 0 minus 2. Gradient comes out to be minus 2. Now the y-intercept, you can read this from the graph, that's equal to 4. So the equation of the straight line is y equals minus 2x plus 4. For question 10, let the two equal sides of the triangle be x. So 2x plus 24 equals 54. So 2x is equal to 30. x comes out to be 15. Now I'm going to drop the perpendicular from the top vertex. And that is the height. And then I'll work with half of this triangle, which is a right angle triangle. So let's extract this triangle on the side. Note that the base of this triangle is 12, which is half of 24. So using Pythagoras theorem, 15 squared is equal to h squared plus 12 squared. So h squared is equal to 15 squared minus 12 squared, which is 81. h comes up to be square root of 81, which is 9. Hence, the area of the big triangle at the top is base times height over 2, which comes out to be 108 cm squared. For question 11, I've got six graphs. Now, A and D are quadratic graphs. They're of the form AX squared plus or minus something else. Now, for the first one, graph A, the coefficient of X squared, that is A, is negative, while for graph D, the coefficient of X squared is positive. The second column, graphs B and E, are reciprocal graphs. They are of the form y equals a over x. For the top one, a is negative. For graph e, a is positive. And for the last column, these are cubic graphs that are of the form y equals ax to the power of 3. And maybe I've got some other terms. In this case, probably I don't. For the top one, a is positive. And for the bottom one, a is negative. So if I go to the three equations I'm given. The first one, that's a negative reciprocal graph, so that's graph B. The second one is a negative quadratic, so that's graph A. And for the last one, that's a negative cubic, so that's graph F. For question 12, I've got this cumulative frequency graph. I need to find an estimate for the median. Note that I've got 60 people, so 60 over 2 is equal to 30, so I need the 30th person. So in order to do so, I'll go on the cumulative frequency axis, go to 30, and then trace this down. So if I do that, I'll get the following. And from the graph, you can see that this goes to a value of 44, so that's my answer. Note that the mark scheme accepts answers between 43.5 up to 44.5. For part B, I need to use the graph to find an estimate of the number of people to longer than 55 minutes. Note that the graph gives me number of people less than 55 minutes. So I'm going to do 60, which is the total, minus a number that I'll read from the graph. So now I'll do the reverse. I'll go to 55 minutes, go all the way up, and then find the corresponding y value. And this will give me the following. So this gives me a value between 48 and 49. Now this must be an integer, so you can either do 60 minus 48, which is 12, or 60 minus 49, which is 11. So 11 or 12 is the final answer. Note that according to the mark scheme, this must be a whole number. 
For part C, I need to complete the frequency table, and to do so, first I'll need to find the cumulative frequencies. To find the cumulative frequencies, I'll go on the graph and find the y values given these x values. So when x is 10, I've got this value here. When x is 20, I get this value here, and so on. So if you go on the graph, read the cumulative frequencies for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and 70, you will get the following. Now, usually I'm given the frequencies and I'm asked to find the cumulative frequencies by doing addition. So the, this one is always three and then plus five will give me eight, plus another number would give me 15 and so on. So now I can use subtractions to find the frequencies. So eight plus a number will give me 15. This number is seven. 15 plus 10 will give me 25 plus 15, this will give me 40, plus 15, I get a 55, plus five, I get a 60. So this is how the completed frequency table looks like. In question 13, I've got a subtraction of two fractions equals 4.3, I'm gonna write this as over one. So now the three denominators are four, five, and one. I need to make them the same so I can cross them out. The lowest common multiple of five, four, and one is 20. So I'll multiply the first one by five, the second one by four, and the third one by 20. So I will get five X plus three minus four, seven minus X equals to 20 times 4.3. If I expand, I will get 5x plus 15 minus 28 plus 4x equals to 86. Now I'll take the 15 and the 28 to the right hand side. So the left hand side will become 9x and the right hand side 99. So x is 99 over 9, which is equal to 11. For part of question 14, I need to find angle DCB, which is this angle here. And to find this, I'll use the fact that opposite angles in a cyclic quadrilateral add up to 180 degrees. Hence, the red angle is 140. So let's write it down here. For part B, I need to find angle ADO. Now, ADO is this angle here. Let me label this as angle X. Now, to find X, I'll need to find two more angles. One of them is this angle here. Let's color this purple. And this angle, the purple one, is twice the red one because angle at the center is twice the angle at the circumference. Since the red one is 140, the purple one is 280. And I will also need to find this angle here. Now I know that these two angles form a right angle because the tangent and the radius are perpendicular. Hence, this angle here, which I will color yellow, is equal to 24. So now let's create an equation where those four angles add up to 360 since angles in a quadrilateral are up to 360. So X plus 40 plus 24 plus 280 equals to 360. So X comes out to be 16 degrees and that's the final answer. For question 15, I'm given 11 observations for team A, and I'm also given that team B has an intercortical range of 42. I need to make a comparison, so first I'll need to find the intercortical range for team A. I'll start by finding the two quartals, so a quarter of 11 is equal to 2.75, which implies that 
q1 is equal to the third value and the third value is 4 similarly 3 quarters of 11 is equal to 8.25 that means that q3 is equal to the ninth observation that's 34 hence i have found q1 and q3 to find the interquartal range that's just q3 minus q1 hence 34 minus 4 is equal to 30. Now if you want to skip these calculations because I have only 11 observations you can note that the middle value is 26 and then this splits the data set into two subsets and the middle value of the left one is 4 the middle value of the right one is 34. Last step is to make a comparison between the two interquartile range. Now I've copied what is accepted and not by the mark scheme. So acceptable answers are the IQR for team B was higher than the IQR for team A, or team B had an interquartile range of 12 more than team A. So comparison between the two stating the difference the runs scored were more spread out for team B than for team A, or the runs for team A were more consistent than obviously team B. Statements that are not acceptable are the following. Team B scored more runs than team A. We don't know that. The average score of B is higher than the average score of A. Similarly, I can't make any conclusion about the average. The IQR of A was 30, while the IQR of B was 42. Now, this is not accepted because I'm not stating the difference while this is accepted. Finally, making a reference to the range and not the interquartile range is also not acceptable. For question 16, I'll start by letting x be equal to this decimal. So 0 0.43838 and so on. The repeating numbers are 3 and 8 and the first digits that are being repeated are the following. So this repeating pattern starts one place after the decimal and it ends three places after the decimal. So I'll need to write 10x and 1000x. 1000x is 438.38 and so on. 10x is equal to 4.38 and so on. So now I can subtract those two. On the left hand side, I'll get 990x. And on the right hand side, the repeating pattern will disappear. So I will get 434. Hence, x equals 434 over 990. If you simplify this, you'll get 217 over 495 as required. For part A, I'll start with the left-hand side. So I have 8 square root of m plus now I'm going to split the square root of 49m to square root of 49 times square root of m. Similarly, square root of 9 times square root of m. So I have 8 square root of m plus, and now the square root of 49 is 7 square root of n minus, similarly, square root of 9 is 3 square root of m. Now you can treat this as... 8 something plus 7 something minus 3 something where that something is the same, like having x for example, and this comes out to be 12 square root of m, so k is equal to 12. And part b, let me just rewrite this expression. Now to write this expression in the required form, I'll need to rationalize the denominator, and to do so, I'll multiply with a fraction where the numerator and the denominator is the same. And it's actually similar to the denominator of the first fraction, but instead of minus, I have a plus. So 1 plus square root of 2 over 1 plus square root of 2. 
So now I can multiply out like this. So I get 5 plus 5 root 2 minus square root of 18 minus square root of 36. When you multiply these two, you get square root of 36. And then in the denominator, I get 1 minus square root of 2 plus square root of 2 minus square root of 4, which is equal to 2. This expansion will give you square root of 4. Now note, these two cancel out. So now I can write this as 5 plus 5 square root of 2. Square root of 18 can be written as square root of 9 times square root of 2. Hence, this is 3 square root of 2 minus the square root of 36, which is 6 over 1 minus 2, which is minus 1. If I simplify the numerator, I will get 5 minus 6, that's minus 1, plus 2 square root of 2 over minus 1. Now, if I split this into two fractions, I will get minus 1 over minus 1 is equal to 1, and 2 root 2 over minus 1 is equal to minus 2 square root of 2. Hence, this is my final answer. For question 18, I have a frequency table and I need to create a histogram. So I'll start by calculating the class width. This is the difference between the upper bound and the lower bound of each group. So 2 minus 0 is 2, 3 minus 2 is 1, and so on. So let me write those down. And then I will need to calculate the frequency density is equal to the frequency divided by the class width. So 12 over 2 is 6, 7 over 1 is 7, 15 over 3 is 5, 12 over 3 is 4, and 9 over 5 is 1.8. So now using the frequency densities, I can draw my bars. So first bar from 0 to 2 with a height of 6. Second one from 2 to 3, height of 7. Next one between 3 and 6 with height of 5. Fourth one between 6 and 9, height of 4. And the last one between 9 and 14 with a height of 1.8. For part B, I'm being told that one of the parcels is chosen at random. I want the probability that this parcel is more than 7 kilograms. Note that the total number of parcels is the sum of the frequencies, which is equal to 55. Now, if I go to my histogram, the parcels more than 7 kilograms are represented by the following region. So I have two thirds of the fourth bar and I have the whole of the last bar. So two thirds times 12 plus nine, which is the last bar gives me 17. Now my denominator is 55. So 17 over 55 is the required probability. For question 19, I have two similar shapes and I am given this relationship and also the difference of the volumes is this one. I need to calculate the volume of B. Now the standard approach for this type of questions is to realize that if the scale factor of the lengths is K, then the scale factor for the area is K squared and the scale factor for the volumes is K to the power of three, you can summarize this in a small table. Now I'm given a relationship between the surface areas. So what I'm saying essentially is that if I take the surface area of A multiplied by K squared, 
then I will get the surface area of B. So essentially 25 over 64 is the scale factor for the area, hence K squared. So if I write K squared is equal to 25 over 64, this gives me a value of K, which is the square root of 25 over 64, which is 5 over 8. Hence the scale factor for the volume, k to the power of 3 is 5 over 8 to the power of 3, which comes out to be 125 over 512. Hence, going back to my table, VA times the scale factor of the volume will give me the volume of B. So I can come on the side and say V in B is equal to to 125 over 512 times VA. And now I can go to the last equation, the difference of the volumes. So I can write VA minus VB equals to 541.8. Since I want to find the volume of B, I will need to replace VA with an expression in VB and I'll get this from here. So if I rearrange, I'll multiply by 512 and divide by 125. So I get 512 over 125 VB equals to VA. So now I can replace this. So coming down, I can write 512 over 125 VB minus VB equals 541.8. Now here, note that I'm subtracting 512 over 125 VB minus 1 VB. So you can type this on the calculator, 512 over 125 minus 1. This will give you 300 and 87 over 125 VB equals 541.8. Hence, VB is equal to 541.8 divided by 387 over 125. And the calculator will give you 175 centimeters cubed. In question 20, I have two simultaneous equations, one linear, one nonlinear. For the linear one, I already have y on its own, so I can go to the nonlinear one and replace this y with this expression. So I get x squared plus 7 minus 2x all squared equals to 34. So now I'm going to expand x squared plus 49 minus 28x plus 4x squared equals to 34. Let's take everything to the left. 5x squared minus 28x plus 15 is equal to 0. Now you can either use the quadratic formula or you can factorize. I'll go with the second one. x minus 5 is the first bracket. 5x minus 3 is the second bracket. This will give me two x values, x equals to five or x equals to three over five. And I'm gonna substitute each one of those x values into the linear equation. So I will get y equals to seven minus two times five. Y comes out to be minus three or y equals 7 minus 2 times 3 over 5, y comes out to be 29 over 5, or as a decimal, this is 5.8. So I'm going to come down here and write the two pairs. And that's the end of this question. For question 21, I'll need to use the following two formulae. The area 
of SVR is 4 pi r squared and the volume is 4 over 3 pi r to the power of 3. So starting with the area, which is given that is 49 pi, that's equal to 4 pi r squared. I can cancel out the pi in each side. So 49 over 4 equals to r squared. So r is the positive square of 49 over 4. That means that the radius is 7 over 2. And now I can go to the formula for the volume and just replace the radius with 7 over 2. Plug this into the calculator and it will give you 179.59 and so on. If you round this to the nearest integer, you get 180 cm to the power of 3. For question 22, I'll start by taking everything to the left. So 6x squared plus 37x minus 35 is less than or equal to 0. Now I will factorize to find the roots or the critical values. So 6x minus 5 and x plus 7 is less than or equal to 0. Now the values of x that make the bracket 0 are the roots. So x equals 5 over 6 is the first root or x equals minus 7. Note I'm using equal and not less than or equal. So next step is to draw a rough sketch of this parabola. I'm not interested in the y-axis, only on the x-axis. So this is how it looks like. And the points on the x-axis are the ones I found. So that's minus 7 and 5 over 6. Now because this expression is less than or equal to 0, it means I want the region below the x-axis, which is this one. And this region starts at minus 7, which is here, ends at 5 over 6. Hence, this is the set of x values I need. So I'm going to write it like this. Minus 7 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 5 over 6. I'm going to start question 23 by using the back face, which is this one. I will extract this here and I will add extra detail on it. So notice that I've joined F, I and dropped the perpendicular from J, the point of intersection. I've labeled it M and this point here K. Now this angle here is 120 because that's a 90 degree angle that is 30 degrees and I will use this triangle to find both X and J M. So using trigonometry, cos of 30 equals to adjacent, which is X over 8. So X is 8 cos 30, which is 4 square root of 3. Now similarly, I can use sine of 30, which is equal to JM over 8. So JM equals 8 sine of 30, which comes out to be 4. Now, once you find X, you can use Pythagoras theorem to find JM as well. So both methods are okay. So now that I found JM, I know that MK is X. I'm given this in the diagram. So let's add this as well. That's X and X. So the height of this shape JK is equal to JM plus MK. So it's 4 plus 4 square root of 3. The next thing I'm going to do is calculate the diagonal of half of the base, which is this one. So if I put the correct points there, remember we label this point as K. Let's label this point here as L. So from this rectangle, ALKG, I want this diagonal. So let's extract 
that blue rectangle. So using Pythagoras theorem, a k squared is equal to x squared plus 12 squared. We found x to be 4 square root of 3 squared plus 12 squared. This gives me 192. So a k is the square root of 192. If you simplify this, you get 8 square root of 3. So finally, I can go to my shape and find the required angle, which is the angle that A, J makes with the base. So basically, I want this right angle triangle, A, K, J. And now I will again extract this. So to find angle A, I'll use tan A equals opposite over the adjacent. So A is equal to the inverse tan of this fraction. Just plug this in the calculator and the value you get is 38.3 degrees. For question 24, I have a translated sine graph. Note that both translations affect the Y coordinates. So basically, the graph doesn't move right or left, it only moves up and down. The A is multiplication by A, B is adding to the Y's. So let's start by considering the original sine graph, which looks like this. Node it passes through the origin, has a maximum at one and a minimum at minus one. So the height of this graph is two. If I go to the translated version, the graph goes from minus two and a half up to three and a half. So its height is six. Hence, to go from two to six, I need to multiply by three. And this gives me my value of A. And to find the value of B, think again of the original graph. It passed through the origin, multiplying by three, still passes through the origin. So in order for the graph to move from the origin to 0 0.5, it means that's a translation of 0 0.5 units upwards. So B 0 0.5 or 1 over 2 as a fraction. In question 25, I need to find the inverse of a quadratic function. Whenever you have to do this, always complete the square using the following formula. I'm also given that x is less than or equal to 2. We will see in a while why this is important. So I'll start by taking out the common factor of 3 from the first two terms. So I get x squared minus 4x and then plus 7. So now I can complete the square for this expression. So note that our b value is equal to 4. If I divide 4 by 2, I get a 2. Inside the bracket, I have a negative sign. So x squared minus 4x becomes x minus 2 squared minus 2 squared. The 2 squared in the end can be written as minus 4. So this is what happens when I complete the square. So if I go back, I'll have 3 and then x minus 2 squared minus 4 and then plus 7. Now I will remove the square brackets. So 3 times the small bracket minus 12 plus 7, which means 3x minus 2 squared minus 5. And I can label this as y. So now I'm ready to find the inverse. The first step I'm going to do is replace x with y and y with x. So x equals to 3, y minus 2 squared minus 5. I'm going to put a comma here and remember that thing I highlighted in red, x is less than or equal to 2. Now this will become y is less than or equal to 2. 
since I'm changing the roles of X and Y. So next step is to rearrange and get the Y on its own. So X plus five is equal to three Y minus two squared. I'll proceed to divide by three. So X plus five over three equals Y minus two squared. Next step is take the square root. So plus or minus the square root of x plus 5 over 3 equals y minus 2. And final step, take the minus 2 to the other side. So 2 plus or minus the square root of x plus 5 over 3 equals 2y. Now, because of this, y must be less than or equal to 2. It means that here I shouldn't have to plus something, but instead I should have to minus something to make sure that my y is less than or equal to zero. Hence, the final answer is only with a negative sign. So two minus the square root of x plus five over three. For question 26, first note that 10 can be written as two times five and 20 that is equal to two times two so two squared times five to the power of one so now i can replace this 10 with two times five i can replace the 20 with two squared times five so for my numerator two to the power of one times five to the power of one all to the power of four n times, and then I'm just going to copy the rest, 2 to the power of 3 n squared minus 5 n times 5 to the power of 2, 1 minus 2 n, and this is all over 20 squared, so 2 squared times 5 to the power of 1 squared, and this is equal to 1. Next step, I'm going to remove the brackets. So in this one, I'm going to multiply these powers, 1 and 4n, same with the powers of 5. So this gives me 2 to the power of 4n times 5 to the power of 4n times, again here, I will expand the brackets. So 2 to the power of 3n squared minus 15n times 5, I'm going to expand the brackets, 2 minus 4n, all over 2 to the power of 4 times 5 to the power of 2. And again, this is equal to 1. In the next step, I will collect powers of 2 and powers of 5. Now for the powers of 2, I will add the powers in the numerator and subtract the power in the denominator. So I will get 2 to the power of 4n plus 3n squared minus 15n minus 4 times 5. Again, I'll do the same thing. 4n plus 2 minus 4n minus 2. So let's write this down. 4n plus 2 minus 4n minus 2. This is equal to 1. Now I'm going to simplify the powers. 2 to the power of 3n squared minus 11n minus 4 times 5. And note that all the powers cancel out. So I've got a 5 to the power of 0, which is equal to 1. Now 5 to the power of 0 is 1. So I'm left with this expression equal to one. Now we know that any number to the power of zero is always one. Let's make a note of that. So a to the zero is equal to one, which implies that three n squared minus 11 n minus four is equal to zero. If I factorize, I will get n minus four times three n plus one is equal to zero. Hence I get n equals four or n equals minus one over three. And those are the two 
required values.